Welcome to the Becoming Aware podcast, where I, Genevieve Faulkner, share what I'm becoming aware of. Hello and welcome to the Becoming Aware podcast. My name is Genevieve Faulkner, your host, and today I want to talk about attachment styles. So what kind of attachment style are you? This is something that I wanted to talk about because I do lots of psychic readings and healings, and it's often something that comes up. And I think Although it is something that is changeable, I think it's something that is great to know about yourself um, so that you can actually begin to identify when it is that you're functioning in a way that's a little dysfunctional so that you can start to shift um, and change and heal what it is that you need to in order to move forward and have, in a sense, a healthier way of relating to other people. So attachment styles is something that was developed by a psychiatrist in the 1930s called Dr. John Bowlby, um, which he developed attachment theory, which is basically looking at the way in which you connect to your mother or or the bond that you had with your mother and um, father, how that kind of influences the relationships and the way in which you react in relationships later in life. So um, when you're basically like when you're born from a spiritual perspective, like or before you're born, I believe that we have like much more access to our beings. So in a sense, we have a much stronger knowing of who we are before we get here. So we kind of like have all of these different abilities that we often don't realize that we have when we get here because we often tend to get so um, programmed into this world that we tend to forget a lot. But before all that, we have this ability to be in communion with the, uh, the mother that we've chosen. Now, communion is basically the space of no separation. So there's no point of view, there's no judgment that creates like a big enough wall to between the mother, the being of the mother and the being of the child, which allows like an ability to have a very strong telepathic connection. And this is vital really for survival the first couple of years of life, right? Now, ideally, if you've got this, what happens is the mother kind of like knows how to respond to you all of the time. Your needs get met. You're safe. You're, you know, you've got like whatever food, whatever comfort, whatever it is that you require in order to thrive. When you've had a parent or a mother that has been able to deliver that, what happens is you'll often grow up to be securely attached. So securely attached is really kind of having this strong sense of knowing who you are, knowing your self-worth, being able to create relationships with other people from a place of um, that security within yourself. So it's kind of like you're able to include them, you're able to include yourself and things don't trigger you so much. It's kind of like things like, um, you know, you, you know that you know that you're valuable. So in a sense, it's kind of like you're able to allow the other person to live their life without requiring them to give up too much in order to prove the value that you have to them. So these are the people that um, in my line of work, I don't come across that often because they're not the ones necessarily seeking a lot of um, healing. They don't require it as much. There's three other attachment styles that tend to show up in my my line of work. So um, when like a parent, when a mother's gone through different things in her life, that will often create kind of like a separation between the child and the mother. And so that form of communication isn't always there or it's stunted in some way or Um, Maybe it's kind of like there and then it's not and then it's there again. Um, And that can create different responses in the way in which the child um, learns to develop, basically. And so if we look at anxious attachment to begin with, so anxiously attached people will have often had a parent that was quite possibly traumatized. They may have or may have been overwhelmed They may have needed to shut down sometimes and withdraw and in that create a separate kind of universe to the one that the child is in, 
yet at the same time they may have also then um you know sometimes been there and so what that does is it creates this weird thing where where the child's brain gets activated to make sure that the attachment to their parent or to their mother is still there so they get very anxious because in a sense like to that child's brain or to that baby's brain like they need that attachment in order to survive right so when that withdrawal like gets created in the mother it triggers all sorts of things and so as the child grows up that's still there basically that original trauma point then influences the relationships that the um, child has later in life and it creates kind of like this um, place where the person will often be incredibly anxious in relationships particularly if their partner is focused on other things because they need that constant reassurance and validation that their partner is there because they're functioning not like an adult necessarily but partially as that traumatized child that needs the other person to survive which isn't actually true but that's what gets kind of like activated in the relationship um, when you've got an anxious attachment style, it might be that the second you get into a relationship, like you might be afraid of it kind of ending. You might be afraid of them betraying you, letting you down, not being there for you. Um, you might get a little paranoid about it. And so you might constantly seek reassurance. What can occur is to other attachment styles, this can be seen as clingy or needy. And often it's those other attachment styles that the universe will kind of like pull in. So what will happen is when you start to get triggered, you trigger them and then it kind of creates them withdrawing a lot of the time. And so then that paranoia and those belief systems can start to get created. And so while it's not kind of like wrong to kind of like require a lot of attention or, you know, have all sorts of things come up in relationships, if you can identify that you're somebody that is anxiously attached and you start to work on the original wounding, what can happen is you can start to feel a lot more secure and that will create often this place where it's kind of like, you find it a lot more easier to be alone. And the more you can kind of like be alone with yourself and know that you're okay, the more you're likely to create relationships with others that in a sense are a lot more easy and a lot more fun because you won't be kind of like, in a sense, pushing them away with the intensity of needing to hold on to them. Okay, so... The second kind of um, attachment style is the avoidant. So the avoidant, they've also had often like um, parents or mothers that have had some sort of trauma have needed to shut down sometimes, yet they can also have the experience of having an anxious attached parent. So the anxious attached parent may be doing all of the things because their brain is in that anxious mode of needing to make sure that the, their um, attached in a way that then creates like anxiety for the baby. So sometimes they'll have that experience where the parent was kind of like overbearing and needy. And so what that child learns is I'm only okay if I'm by myself, like it's not safe to be around people. I lose myself if I'm with others, because when a parent is anxious in anxious attachment, what happens is the connections that they're making is very much about fulfilling the needs that have not been fulfilled in childhood. And so in a sense, it excludes the other people in the relationship until that need is met. And so as the child was, when the child was little, it's kind of like they may have experienced their, you know, the relationship not really being about them, it being about what the parent needed. And so they're only kind of safe by themselves. What also can kind of create um, avoidantly attached people is where it's kind of like they've been through so much, but nobody's kind of like had their back. So they may have had a parent that was an avoidant that was, 
not able to deal with whatever they were going through. Um, it can be as simple as like, you know, like the cry it out method, you know, uh, when you leave babies to cry, like sometimes that, that in itself can be traumatic. And so in the beginning, like somebody that's experienced that method, not all like some, for some people it might work, but for some kids, um, you know, that might create that anxiously attached, uh, way of being because, you know, it's, it's scary, it's traumatic. And so it starts to cry to try and get its parents, um, attention. And so maybe the parent came back and took, looked after it, but that may have then created like an anxious attachment. Now, if the parent did that over and over and over and over again, what can happen is that the baby learns, well, this, you know, no one's going to come. So there's no point in crying. And so to the outside world, it might look, yay, success, the baby's going to sleep by itself. Yet within the baby's nervous system, it may be still quite distressed, but it may have learned to give up. And so that is also what can sometimes create um, avoidant type uh, attachment where they've basically learned there is no one there to help them. They must do everything all on their own. And in a sense, like people who are avoidant, they've, because sometimes they have had that knee, um, anxious attached parent, they have often like points of view that any kind of need is wrong. They're not supposed to have need. Others aren't supposed to have need. So they'll deny their own needs and they will try and avoid and run from needy people, which causes them to be this magnet for needy people. So the anxiously attached and the avoidantly attached will often be this magnet for each other because they'll create this push and pull dynamic of one kind of like needing, you know, the connection to feel safe and the other ones needing to be alone to feel safe. And so they'll do this kind of, yet the one that's needing to be alone to be safe will often crave the intimacy too. So the second they, um, you know, the, the needy one or the anxious one will kind of like uh, project an intensity of need at the avoidant and the avoidant will withdraw. And then the second the needy one starts to give up, that's when the avoidant will start to seek connection again um, because, you know, they're seeking, they're desiring a lot of the time the intimacy. It's just that they get triggered and the trauma gets brought up. Um, there is a third, another one, which is disorganized attachment, which is a bit of both. So some people have had, um, the experience of maybe having one parent be one way, another parent being the other. And so they can create being anxiously attached and avoidantly attached at different times and different situations will trigger the different ways of responding to people. Um, basically though, with all of this, what I want to get across is that it is changeable. Um, this is something that I do quite a bit of work with, with people. So I have a program called being the source, which is about assisting people to actually reclaim their being, like step into the energy of who they actually are beyond all of this kind of programming. So we do a lot of work kind of like healing that early childhood trauma shifting beyond the paradigms of the parent um, so that people can actually step into being the creative source of their own life. Um, I also do one-to-one -one healing sessions using the methods of theta healing, which also can assist people to go beyond this. Because here's the thing is in order to change it, there's a couple of things that have to occur. So one, sometimes you do have to look at the early the early issues that created like that attachment. So it might be anxious. It might be avoidant. It doesn't matter either way. Um, there's usually trauma there. So in a sense, you've got to work on kind of like shifting that trauma, letting go of the points of view that have been connected to the trauma, to what it is that you've decided about people or relationships based upon the trauma. Um, and yet, also, sometimes what's required is also to have the experience of relationships and allow yourself to be present in each moment in the relationships 
and notice when you're triggered and then kind of like work on yourself or be the demand of yourself that you're going to change the pattern. So in a sense, it's kind of like acknowledging, you know, the, and that may mean at certain times getting healing or getting help or doing some sort of meditation to assist yourself to move beyond the triggering. Um, and other times it might actually be the demand of, okay, I'm going to make a different choice right now. Like I'm, I'm, I'm triggered. I want to run away if I'm avoidant or, you know, I want to send like a million text messages if I'm anxious. Um, but I'm not going to do that because I'm going to acknowledge that I'm in my stuff right now and this isn't about the other person and I'm going to work on myself or I'm going to actually sit with this until I'm in a, in a different state. Now, why this is important well, you, if you are one of these attachment styles and like I just read the book Attached, I can't remember who wrote it, but they were saying in it that around 50% of the population is securely attached. So I'm not sure where they got that number from, but if that's the case, 50% of the population fall into the other categories. If you're in those categories, if you're not actually looking at what it is that is going on for you and the way in which you respond to other people and are in relationships, you are in danger of creating toxic type dynamics in relationships. So when you don't um, uh, kind of like look inwards and heal whatever needs to be healed, you'll blame the other person. And so that's where anxiously attached, avoidantly attached or disorganized attachment people will play these push and pull intimacy games of kind of like wanting to be close, but then pulling away. Um, and, you know, it's it's kind of like all those power play games. And when that just continues on and on and on, it just reinforces the earlier experience that you've had. And it creates like a lack of intimacy in relationships, but also with you. OK, because when you're blaming the other person for the way that they are being with you, it's actually stopping you from going inwards and looking at, well, hang on a minute, where am, where am I? What is it that is creating me being a vibrational frequency that's in alignment with this? Okay, because that's the thing. For you to pull in relationships like that, a lot of the time it's because you're at a vibrational frequency that validates that programming, okay? To the anxiously attached, the avoidant validates the anxious attachments belief systems because they believe someone isn't going to be there for them. They or they believe that, you know, they're going to be abandoned or they're going to be betrayed. And when the avoidant needs space, that's what it can feel like to the anxiously attached. It's like, ah, oh, I've been abandoned. So it validates it. Um, to the avoidance, it's the opposite. It's like they'll believe that, um, there's no space for them in relationship. And because the anxiously attached is so demanding and needing, you know, things, it's kind of like they cease to be acknowledged or what they require ceases to be acknowledged in the relationship. And so that validates that point of view. And so this is how this dance continues to kind of play out over and over and over and over again in relationships, unless you end the pattern. And here's the other thing is that this won't just play out in um, romantic relationships. It will play out in every area of your life. If you're avoidant, you are going to sabotage um, you know, the work relationships you have, you're going to sabotage the, if you're creating a business, you'll sabotage that because those avoidant programs will come up and you will withdraw from the world and not engage. And that will limit what it is that you can create financially as well. So same with anxious. If you're anxious, you might be a little too demanding with people and not, not a kind of like include the other person enough in relationships. And again, that can not just affect your romantic life, that can affect your friendships, your family, your business, you know, everything. So like if you fall into one of these categories, look at yourself. What is it that needs to be addressed? Not in the relationship that's triggered it, because those people are being a gift in a sense by showing up the way that they are. But go back further and look at, okay, 
What wound is this bringing up for me? What belief systems do I have that this is validating? And if I chose to change them, what would be different? Because the thing is with all of this, in a sense, in order to go beyond it, you've got to be more willing to be there for you. When it's kind of like no one can abandon you if you're not willing to abandon yourself, so to speak, because when you're not willing to abandon yourself, you're always present and you're always aware. And so you always kind of get a sense of what's going on for everybody else. And you don't take it personally or see it as an abandonment when someone withdraws from you, because it's kind of like, you know, that that's their stuff, not yours. Right. And so the more you're kind of like willing to be present with you and have your own back and, and transmute the pain that's within your world around the people that couldn't be there for you or couldn't show up for you or the way in which they treated you, um, the more you can actually start to create secure attachment and also just healthier relationships. So often this anxious avoidant um, dynamic or disorganized, they're all avoiding intimacy. They're all avoiding being present with, with, ooh, with themselves. And they're doing that a lot of the time to avoid pain, to avoid the pain of being rejected by a parent, by a, abandoned by a parent, let down, disappointed, all of these things. And so the same thing will often happen over and over again, unless you deal with that original thing. So in a sense, sometimes you do have to move through the pain. You've got to be present with it. You've got to acknowledge it. Sometimes you might need help with that. Um, energy healing is a great way of shifting things. Um, breath work can help. Uh, you know, sometimes counseling might be the way to go, like whatever works for you. But, um, yeah, I highly recommend if, if you do have a sense that you fall into one of these attachment styles, maybe start working on changing it. Your life will become greater if you allow yourself to move beyond the wounding. Um, if you would like any information about the ways in which, um, I assist people through my being the source program um, or one-to-one -one 30 healing sessions. I'll leave links below this video. Um, there is a great book called Attached um, on this. I can't remember who wrote it though, but I will leave a link to that as well. Um, thank you so much for listening, guys. I'm very grateful. If there's anything that you would like me to do a podcast episode about, feel free uh, to um, leave me a message. And if this contributed to you, feel free to share it or leave a comment for me. Um, thank you so much. I'm very grateful for you for listening. So thanks guys. Until next time.